Welcome to the Impact X Info Session. I acknowledge that I'm hosting this workshop from the land of the Garigal people of the Eora Nation. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you all work today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this information session today. Thank you everyone for taking the time to attend um, this information session and for those of you watching this on YouTube. We're very excited to be launching our brand new Impact X pre-accelerator program designed and delivered by UNSW founders with support from the George Institute for Global Health. And this is all being made possible by the generous support of Investment New South Wales. So what are we here for? So firstly, what is Impact X? The Impact X pre-accelerator is dedicated to making a difference in the lives of those often overlooked and underserved. This program is designed to support promising healthcare initiatives that specifically focus on marginalized and underrepresented communities. If you're a passionate founder looking to drive meaningful impact and be part of a diverse, supportive community, Impact X pre-accelerator is the place for you. So today we'll be talking about what the program is, who it's for, what, who are, what are we looking for, and more details about what happens during the 10-week program. We're also going to have a bit of discussion with two um, founders who are different parts of their journey in terms of the benefits of a pre-accelerator program and what are the, some of the lessons they've learned. So thank you again and let's start. Thanks, Dina. So I think the record button has been hit. <laughs> Thanks, Dina. So, so I think that's one of the great things about this program because it's more about the impact we want to create with our ideas, especially uh, programs that are focused on communities that don't normally get that much um, attention from entrepreneurship, maybe because um, there's not enough money in it or there's the VCs aren't interested or there is no... Um, big business opportunity. So that's why this is a great program for people who are in the early stages of their ideas. They want to make a difference. They want to make an impact and they're trying to and entrepreneurship. And this program is one of the ways to do it. So that's what it is. So I think that's what makes it really, I guess, cool and exciting. And the other thing I find, and so who is it for? We are very fortunate that uh, we have funding um, and being supported by Investment New South Wales. And so it is the, the program is free, but it is for people who you must reside in New South Wales, since it's funded by New South Wales government, but anywhere in New South Wales. And we highly encourage applications from more from Western Sydney as well. And you're in really early stages of developing your idea in terms of that your ideas are in that. Um, so you don't have a product, so that's fine. You don't, your, your product might be a, vague idea or your solution that is okay this is the best program for you we also believe that for people to understand the needs of underserved communities sometimes the best people for that are people from underserved communities to know what's best, how best to serve them so this program is for the uh, for those founders as well and i've been asked this question a lot when people say but i have no idea what an mvp or a vc or a um, serial or any of those terms mean and this is a program for you because you don't need the prior experience. You don't need to be an entrepreneur yet. <laughs> you may still be testing. Is this journey for you? So that's who it's for. What happens once you're in the program? So there'll be 10 teams will be selected into the 10 week, and it's a 10 week program. Every week on Wednesday mornings, um, we um, are in um, the UNSW Parameter Innovation Hub. We'll be having master classes. So this is every week, 10 weeks in the morning, Wednesday mornings, we'll be having these classes. We have a great lineup of speakers and you kind of be going through the whole, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Who is this problem? Who does this problem affect? Who's gonna pay for this problem? Or who, for sometimes who pays and who benefits are different? And then why is health such a unique space? So you'll be going through all of that. Um, what is also um, very different and very unique about this program is you get every week one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions. So you get a startup coach or mentor to kind of 
help you a bit more in your journey on top of the masterclass. Um, this is linked with UNSW founders because they're part of delivering and designing and you get access to office hours with mentors. Um, Dina can talk a bit more about that, but these are your IP, your lawyers, all that financial stuff, all that stuff, which um, I know as a health people, we are not very familiar with. We also, during those master classes, have a bit of accountability in terms of a community that every week we kind of share what we've learned, what our challenges are, and we kind of support each other. And, um, and there's it both online and in person. And we also have additional resources in terms of their events that UNSW Founders runs um, on a monthly basis, but also lots of workshops, seminars, training. So you kind of come into that space. You're supported in that space. And one of the coolest things I think about the program is you have access to the maker space at UNSW. And it's very cool because you get to not only think of your ideas, but get to play and try to prototype and make them. I think the coolest thing is the 3D laser printer personally, but that's just me. And you also have the access to the perks. So before I ha um, hand it over to my to the, um, the others is applications close next Friday on the 25th of August. So on the website where it says apply now, if you are stuck anywhere in the application, feel free to send me an email and we can talk it through and help you in that in the application stage. The program itself is the 20th of September till the 22nd of November um, at the UNSW Parramatta Innovation Hub on Wednesday mornings. You will also have the option to join online, so it's hybrid. And pitch night is the 7th of December. It is not a scary thought. I know some people think it's very scary, but it's more about a celebration of what you've achieved. And you don't know who is in the audience, kind of thing, and who might be able to help you make your dreams a reality or help you kind of move on to the next step or help you make impact. So that's just about the program. So if you've got any questions, uh, overview of the program, feel free to put in the chat box. But next, as I said, we are very, very fortunate to have um, and here to, um, to talk um, and, okay, thanks Dina for putting in my, email address <laughs> um I, i'm accepting on both email addresses but that's <laughs> um, but thank you for that um so we've got um and i think i'll so and just uh, the reason we asked her to come and talk because she's been through the a different pre-accelerator and an accelerator program um um, she's just amazing when you see her see when you look her up on LinkedIn or anything you just like <laughs> or oh, in complete or oh. I would sometimes think when do you sleep but, um, <laughs> tell a bit about yourself and what you do because I don't know like there too, there's too many things for me to <laughs> take on kind of thing. thank you Rabia all right well the first thing I would like to say is just again acknowledge um, UNSW for what they've achieved and what they've helped me and my business partner achieve from our business end of things and i i can honestly say to people who are interested in this this actual impact program do it no matter how many fears you have no matter how many sort of resistance you know confidence issues vulnerabilities just step into it because the reason you're on this on this call today is in itself you know leading you to to this space so um the first thing I want to say before I introduce myself, I guess, and what I'm what I'm doing and what I'm not, what I should be doing, but what I'm not doing is I'm always doing the same thing, which is about being flexible. I think as a founder, the, the success behind this program for us and being part of it has genuinely taught us what our blind spots were. I had no idea what our blind spots were until we actually participated in this program. It was rigorous. It was very stressful. There were moments of tears. There was moments where I had to apologize to some of our mentors for being quite, um, I would almost say quite um, antagonistic. So what is really important here is that my background is commercial. Um, I became an academic at 37. As you can see, my background um, at the moment, excuse the pun, it's at university. I'm an academic here at the moment. I'm teaching. And I also teach a very um, troubling area of science. I teach bioethics 
and I'm a philosopher of science, which means I genuinely have issues associated with factors within the world of science in the business context, because a lot of things can be taken out of context in this concept of marketing. So what does that mean to have an impact, but to be ethical, but to actually be sustainable and to support, you know, others coming through without being too negative in the sense of that, you know, especially with technology changing as fast as in, in the sense of AI. So I guess to introduce myself, I'm currently finishing my PhD. This is technically my second PhD, um, but the reason I say that is I changed my mind, my PhD in medicine, I disagreed with my own hypothesis, even though I published all that work. And I'm now writing a book about um, decision-making, but in the addiction space. And I'm looking at cultural models of care. And that cultural model, believe it or not, is our commercial idea, which was bringing a non-pharmacological, low-risk, high-impact product to market globally, for people, especially in these underserved communities that would never have access to psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, or a mentor for that matter. Um, and we now are working across, um, I guess, six countries. We have IP protected ourselves globally. We've finished our IP reporting. The peer reviewers from that survey or reports have come back to show us that our concept is novel. It's innovative. We've only had one major competitor in the market because what our program does, um, I guess why I call it a program, not a product, is we are also a business model that enables other businesses to generate more revenue. So I thought what I'd quickly do is people love learning by examples. We, we tend to switch off when people talk to us. So um, that's how I learn. I'm a creative. I tell everyone I'm a creative first and foremost, and so are you. That's why you're on this call. I'm going to share my screen. Um, Rabia, can you, Adina, just give me a share screen? Um, access there if that's okay and i might just if you can all see me there yes fantastic okay so can you all see that is everyone able to see that great yeah. thank you so what this is this is our american um client but he also wears the agency hat and it's it's a company called pragmatic solutions which is actually um their billability is to uncle sam directly so american government's medicaid and medicare has a different system to us in the age of 65 plus, they get funded each person to have access to these services and products, chronic care management, remote patient monitoring, remote therapeutic monitoring, principal care, and our product, which is believe it or not, a personalized music as intervention for people with sleep issues, as well as people with anxiety issues, but mainly sleep. A lot of these 65 year olds and over cannot take any sleep medication because they're either suffering from diabetes or other, other um, chronic illnesses. And therefore, um, I guess, body-wise, they can't be incapacitated with even more drugs. So we actually fit into this area here, which is a behavioral, um, they call it, it's very interesting how they call it, the behavioral um, mental health care is, is something that's very unique to the, the US. It's not, not called that in Australia. And what we do is we're now selling directly through this company and i'll show you our product and this is now going to take you to our licensing platform so we license our product to this american company who then on sells it to social workers psychologists psychiatrists practices across mainly the boston massachusetts area and as you can see this is a content managed system which is now our organization and explains how to use the music there's a free week trial and once they log in and they actually you can see here we've been very transparent in our branding. My Sound Wellbeing is actually working with Pragmatic Solutions as intervention to its patients. There's a free trial process so their clients can use it first. Then there's a monthly access. This is our billability scheme in the US. And as you can see at the bottom right here, because we're a software program, it's powered by My Sound. Now, the same thing is in Australia. I'm going to show you this. So, this is an Australian client, completely different market. But again, someone who has 11,000 users on her Instagram, she's very, very much an influencer. She works for Mecca. She works for all these big corporations as an influencer for 65 years and over. Um, Claudia is exceptional. She's, she's incredibly dynamic. Actually, when I met her, she reminded me a lot of Dina because she just knows everybody. She's so organized. She's so plugged into to what's happening in Sydney and around the world. And her product, she's a coach. So she has a styling service here and what she does globally, she offers different services, ultimate package and personal styling. As part of her package, we've actually now, and this is where I'm gonna talk about my charity in a minute, I have um, intellectually protected my coaching 
services, which is an intervention in, in the mental health space. We, she's on selling that as a white label product, as well as our product for our music. And as you can see here, once they book and they connect with her, it takes them through to a landing page, which also sells on the product. And this is what her product will look like from a billability for coaching products and services. And there's her divine sound. And these are her packages for her package um, for her coaching clients. So I wanted to show you that to show you a live active Australian company that's on selling our product white labeled, but supported by my sound wellbeing and an American clinical um, organization where the clinician who's in charge of the public health expert working across mainly FDA approved um, billable clients. So we, we now have access to their registries. We know who, who we can actually charge. So it's opened up a big market for us. So to talk again about um, you as a startup, as a founder, never doubt yourself that you don't yet have the expertise. The whole point of you being part of this program that is on offer at UNSW is to teach you to become confident in areas that you still obviously need to learn about. And every day, I mean, I'm 47, I'm, I'm publishing papers, I'm working as an academic, um, I'm on the bus talking to people, I'm on the train talking to people, I'm traveling around the world giving papers, I'm, in, I'm everywhere at the same time as very organized. I think what this program has taught us is how to not try and be too compartmentalized in your thinking. You know, be yourself, go out there, be a creative person, you know, be ethical, be loving, be compassionate. Um, be all of those things that you should be and you'll very very quickly see that soon you'll be able to connect those dots that that person fits in here and that person fits in there and the more transparent you are about I guess where you're at the stage of your business the more people respect you so I'm very open to telling people listen we're early stage we've only got x amount of users we're only working in two or three countries at this point in time yesterday for example we got an inquiry from Canada um, they've got, they've got 2 million users, 140,000 people on Instagram. This is a big influencer in the health space. They, they contacted us. So they heard about us through the grapevine. I didn't know how they heard about us. So what I'm trying to say is you don't know where your networks will turn around and find you because you, you spoke to someone on a tram in Melbourne, or you on an airplane, you spoke to someone on, on route to Singapore. So in a nutshell, um, obviously questions can come later. What I do want to leave you with is that. Try to get some clarity in your mind as to what drives you as an individual. Um, you know, there's, there's definitely, Ravia talked about, do I sleep? I have two German shorthead pointers. They do 27,000 steps a day with me. I have to go walking. I have to meet people. So I'm exhausted just from walking the dogs, never mind my workload. But genuinely, if you ask me, even in my most exhausted moment during my day, if I said to you, if I shook you at four o'clock in the morning in your deepest of sleep, what drives you? What gets you out of bed? And for me, it genuinely is about reaching people who will never have access to world-class care. And our product, in my opinion, has the capacity to really help someone sleep better and feel less anxious every day when they don't have access in their countries. And mainly we work in Pakistan and India, um, especially with young people who will never be able to afford to see a professional. So work out for yourself. That's my sort of parting message. What really gets you, gets you excited about life? What, what will push you through the fears of potentially not getting this funded or not getting this idea off the ground? And you will find that all these wonderful people on the screen that might become your peer support group in the future, um, we all have something to, to share and help each other with. And I've, more and more I'm learning we're a community of business owners and, and business supporters. There's no I in business. You genuinely need each other. So become a little bit more vulnerable. Um, don't be afraid. Thank you so much. I hope that helped. Yeah. Um, thanks, Ange. Thanks for, um, I think you've got a, a few people might be stalking you on LinkedIn. <laughs> and a few party. Um, I think there's a, one of those um, celebratory ones. So thank you for sharing your story. Um, and congratulations on all on the success with the ver with the various um, avenues. What I'm curious to hear is when you first started, right? Think back all those years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the thing when you when that before you when you submitted your expression of interest to the pre accelerator, mm -hmm. what like 
where was your idea? So because at the moment when people see it, they're like, oh my God. Like, but that's because mm. of all the work you've done when you were at that pre-accelerator stage, where were you at? Like, what did it look like? All right, I think this is a really important question because we actually didn't know where we were at. And the point of coming to this to this program helped us to really crystallize, you know, where to from here. So the idea we had at the time was my business partner is exceptional, very dynamic in the sense of the meditation space. We call him our guru. He is from India. This is his grandparents' formula. It's been around for 5,000 years. He's the keeper of the sacred formula. And we've been friends for many years. And we come together with this idea that this, this, this novel let's call it formula, could be embedded into music and it could be delivered using technology. And my background, because I was commercial, the commercial side wasn't a sort of a, a challenge for us. Ours, our challenge was, how do you take this idea and make it scientifically valid where you don't sort of upset the business world because the business world, they don't like academics, right? They don't understand academics. And because I came from business before I went into academia, I understood it wasn't that people were threatened by it, it's that academics think about stuff and it takes very long to come with an idea and to take it to market. So another just point there is be very mindful who your audience is when you do your discussions and who you're pitching to. Because if you're talking to a, a person with, with money um, who wants to invest in your business or you're talking to someone who's interested in your product, don't get too sucked into the details. Go very much into listen to what they what, where their level is of what they want to hear. So our idea was... Did we need to be more clinical? Did we need to validate more on the, on the scientific side? Or had we been scientifically sort of, are we too, too much in the science and not enough in the commercial? And that is why this program was so useful to us was we found that, that, middle, that middle way um, and that then opened the doors to becoming a little bit more clear in our own thinking. Okay, um, thanks Ange. And I think that's what's quite key is that um, I think sometimes people feel when they see these um, programs that they're kind of coming with a solution. And it's great to hear that you guys were pretty vague. <laughs> you kind of like, in the, or, I mean, you had an idea, but it wasn't very, um, it didn't look like what it looks like right now at all. Um, and if people have any questions for Ange, please feel free to put them in the chat box and we'll go through them. One of the other things, um, if you, if um, what were the opportunities you thought you think you got by doing the program, which you wouldn't have, say, if you didn't actually make the decision and participate in the program? Like, right, I, I genuinely think that those opportunities are still coming through for us even now. Mm -hmm. um, an example would be, you know, I have this passion to do things very well, and I call it the the tortoise and the hare. I would rather be the tortoise getting this thing to market, doing it properly, then racing there and then just go, well, it, it wasn't such a great outcome after all. We might have made a million bucks or two million dollars. But for me, it's like, let's, let's, with, with Sulap, my business partner, let's see what we're trying to, to do here. So I think one of the big opportunities was to think a little bit more in the sense of the types of, of sectors that we could then market to. And I think Dina and Sidonia too helped us with that the academic side of think had an avenue of opportunities for us. Like we're still in the in the discussions with the George Institute now about possibly looking at how does our what is our next phase of scientific validation look like, which will have an impact from from a from an academic perspective, but also from a commercial perspective. And then they also helped us to look at you know opportunities associated with bringing consultants in. What kind of consultants? Do you sell equity? Don't you sell equity? When is the good time to bring in a venture capitalist? And what Dina, I think, always taught me was, and I was very stubborn in the beginning, and I think I've become a much more holistic person now, <laughs> thanks to you, Dina, um, is to not be so bull, bullish in the, the way that you perceive things having to sort of take its form. You know, you might not be wanting to sell equity in your business, and you might not want to bring in an investor. But start to think about what investors want to hear about what you're trying to do, because you might meet someone who's a silent investor who just wants to give you 50 grand to just go and develop some tech. That's an investor. It might be an angel investor. So be ready. And I think those are the opportunities, the networks that Dean introduced us to, but also the mindset. 
you know, business people tend to be islands. We, we live on our own, we're in our own head. We, we, we really focus people. Um, and I think you need this community to remind you that you don't have to do this on your own. So that was really the gold for us was to have these opportunities. Thanks, Ange. Um, are there any questions for Ange? Nothing in the chat. Nothing in the chat. Um, I might say one more thing just about the tech space yeah. in Australia. So the other um, mention for the group is don't get disheartened if Australia is not interested in your product. There's a big, big world out there. And the Australian market is very small. It's very niche. It's very clicky. It's, you know, it's you, by the end of the, your, your program, you'll know everyone who does everything from TGA to the, who's got the money to, you'll eventually have all that down packed. Never be afraid to think. And I think Pedro, you're going to talk to us about these other sectors. Don't be afraid to venture into other countries. So for us, we knew our money, our income would never come from Australia. We still have Australian clients, mm -hmm. but not at the income stream level. Um, that the other countries have. So use Australia as your stomping ground to practice, but there's a huge platform out there. And because of technology, you literally at the click of a finger can be earning money while you're sleeping. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Ange. And I just wanted to kind of, um, and before we um, quiz Pedro, I just wanted to ask in terms of like what, and I think a lot of people don't realize is what entrepreneurship also allows is that funding can be used because I know you've got a charity and uh, and the program is available in India and Pakistan. Like what having paying customers means for having impact in, in underserved communities. All right, so the reason the charity exists, I have a board of eight. I founded this charity in 2017. And it was basically because we had young people who couldn't afford any kind of health care. This is way before our music product came to market. And that charity has been funded. I mean, I have, I work, I do, I work around the clock on any grant. You can ask me wherever there is money, I'm onto it and applying for it. So try and get in as many applications as you can for all these different funding schemes. But where the charity helped was it, it introduced us to a very different kind of person, which was always your philanthropy community. And the philanthropy community genuinely wants to be involved in your commercial life as well because they love being involved in cutting edge sort of product services and research so the reason i started the charity was because any money that we earn from the business we'd rather give it to our charity because then that gives back to people with with what we're trying to do in other cultures but it also introduced us to a whole bunch of people with different networks who then can help us with both so um youth was one market and that's what the charity does the business, of course, works with all ages. So yeah, the commercial space is, they're very separate, but but networks wise, they're actually very similar. Okay, thanks, Ange, that's really interesting. Um, I think, V, go ahead, you've got a question. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Sorry, sometimes I'm I'm worried that I accidentally speak <laughs> to myself when I'm actually saying something, so um, just sound check. Um, thank you so much, Angie, for sharing your wonderful journey. I just do have one genuine question, seeing how you wear so many different hats and you had your personal life, you had your working life and everything that you're so passionate about. Just one question. Did you have enough time to breathe? Like, is the, is the concept of work-life balance even exist? Or like, how do you manage everything and still have like a quality life with your personal life versus your work life or like other... Mm -hmm other things like how, how do you strike a balance for your well-being <laughs> well because i suppose we the well-being specialist at this university co cohort that's what i actually help students with is how to manage their well-being um thank you for your question v i think it's important to know what your limits are you you have to know what your own limits are and you'll only know what your limits are when you've pushed yourself to the max so for me i'm i'm, I'm an immigrant to australia I supported my family for the first eight years. I worked four jobs um, until I got my residency. Then I bought a house for them. And then I moved to Sydney. And then I started academia at the age of 37. Um, and for me, I genuinely live for today. I live as if there is no tomorrow. And my, my personal life, all the people in my personal life, actually last night I went to, the, to a cinema to watch Oppenheimer with my colleagues who are physicists at the university and with my first sort of social night off in ages. And they were like, 
And I'm like, I'm actually bored. I'm used to checking emails. I'm doing all these things. Um, I'm so engaged in what I do. Um, I don't, I don't, you know how people see it as work life balance. There's a dichotomy. I think that's also an issue. We need to really look at, first of all, what your, what your limitations are. But secondly, you know, why do you split the two? And I think if you have three children, it's a very different story. I don't have any children. If I had children, I'm sure it would be a very different, just different sort of scenario. But how, when I rest, I rest. And when I work, I work. So when I rest and I have a day off, for example, and I do, I take about three days off every month. That's the only time I have off. And when I have those three days off, I do not take phone calls. I'm off the grid and I'm genuinely either sleeping or writing some of my work. And I know what my limitations are. So I know if my, you know, my, my immune system's down a bit, but because I stay fit, I go walking every morning, I'm up at six and I'm, my day is full. I don't see it as um, that anything is missing, but there's also only a period of time. I don't want to be doing this when I'm 80. <laughs> I'm doing this now because I'm, you know, 47 years old. And I'm saying to myself, we're going to make this work. And then worst case scenario, we gave it a go. A go. So yeah, you have to know what your limitations are. I think Pedro, I mean, he's a dancer. He's going to tell you a bit by his dancing. I think dancing, <laughs> takes the stress away you've got to find where your outlet is and my outlet is definitely my animals i spend a lot of time um with my dogs out in nature so yeah hope that answers your question thanks Ange, and thank you for that because i think that's the key thing is that um uh, that it, it's about pursuing your passions and your dreams but also knowing your limits so we've got another founder um pedro and um, and will be part of the Impact X program, but Pedro, just kind of, I know you've done a pre accelerator. What did you? Um, and we'll talk about your. Uh, and then you can tell uh, tell us your business. Um, but what did you find most useful in for especially everybody else here who's kind of on the fence about doing a pre accelerator? What did you think it provided you with? Yeah, well, um, just to be a, a bit of context. Um, I'm working on Innova IVF, which is a startup that's building a medical device to streamline and optimize the selection of embryos in before it's transferred back to the patients. So um, I brought this idea to the United States to understand the market. And the pre-accelerator basically helped me to structure what needed to be done for us to understand the gap between the science and what is in reality the user, the final user of our technology. And then in conversations with both patients, in our case, embryologists, and even fertility ex uh, clinic executives, we tapped on, we figured that there were some needs that needed to, some jobs to be done, how it's called, that we use now in an approach to investors. So we explain exactly what is what we're solving, what is the problem, how we solve it, in what the product is. I think that the accelerator program is exactly that because most um, researcher or people that has an idea don't have the structure and don't know really how to explain in simple terms what they're doing, which is incredibly necessary to have those conversations tomorrow to, to get funded or even to get your first client. So the accelerator program in our case help us to to structure all of that and put together a plan for for us to work with with the university um thanks pedro um also so so what did your idea look like when you first started the program oh first of all you, you need to know that your idea today might be very different to what's going to be in three months six months a year and so on because the more you talk with your customers, the more you see that your idea or your initial assumptions might change and therefore your business plan will change. So we started with an idea of an artificial intelligence system that would allow us to score and rank in the embryos. But then we figured that there were some other competitors doing similar stuff and that, that we had the opportunity of merging different research uh, from um, different founders that actually we're working with. Um, to combine that and create a completely novel solution for IVF. So it started as an AI solution, and now it's a medical device. 
Um, wow, that is a big change from an AI solution to a medical device. And it's interesting that um, the, the pre-accelerator and the accelerator, those programs really helped you kind of define that. Um, what would be the advice you would give to people thinking of the program? Like how would they maximize um, being part of such a program? I think that first of all, I I was told this phrase and the best time, the best time to start um, startup was yesterday. The second best time is today. So if you really want to start this journey, do it now, apply, and we're going to be together 10 weeks in this program where we're going to guide you. Um, I'm not sure if you have already showed the program outline, but we're going to cover very important aspects of this journey to prepare you to then accelerate your your business so that that will include for example uh, validation of your um customers market feed um cons customer discovery um develop an mvp if it's um e either a uh, software or hardware and then prototyping that uh, there's going to be a session as well at unsw Mark makerspace um very important uh, you want to protect your ip so there's going to be a session as well about regulation and IP management. Um, go to market strategy. Very important. Once you have a product, how is that you're going to take it to market? Are you going to start in Australia? You're thinking of working with other, um, other nations. You want to show, um, start working in the US, in Europe, China. That's important as well. And then how you want to um, approach investors so working on pitching and also how you're going to interact with different type of investors because you will see that there are pre-seed investors angels then you have seed or series a and so on so you you want to also understand what's going to be that path so you can prepare yourself on how to pitch to different investors depending on your development um thanks thanks pedro um so when you started off, you had um, a vague idea. You you knew the problem you were solving. Did and did the um accelerate the pre-accelerator help you define that problem? Like did the problem change? Like what what did it do in terms of helping you think about the problem? So <clears throat> the the pre-accelerator program helped us to to define it very well what the problem is our solution and how the product will fill that gap, basically. You need to define the product very well. And sometimes coming from academia, researchers come from the solution because they are researching. So you need to understand what is what you're solving very well and who are those customers that you're actually working with. And in our case, it helps us to identify that there are different customers or what is called like different users. Because in our case, one are the patients that are those that are actually more benefited from the solution. But at the same time, we're working with the embryologists who are using the technology to select the embryo before transfer. So we also needed to work with the um, fertility clinic executives because they are going to invest in our technology so then the embryologists can use it for the delivery to the patients. And like that, we also learn that in other countries like in the United States, because of the healthcare system is so fragmented, we understood that we need to work as well with insurers because in certain states, um, the fertility um, fertility is included or is um, it's necessary to be included in the insurance policy. So understanding all of that, you kind of understand what is the business and actually how to uh, monetize your idea. And if everything goes well, what's the impact of your solution, which couldn't have happened if you didn't go on this journey? What difference does it make for um, people? In our case, um, fertility is a major issue because um, the population is kind of pushing for the latest stages in their lives, the maternity. So um, that comes with some biological issues. And therefore, they are struggling to, to, to have babies. So what we're doing today is to help them to, um, to remove the barriers to start a family with the technology available in the market. By the way, fertility issues are very expensive. So by using technology, we can help couples and as well 
of the, the entire uh, uh, system of IVF to make it more accessible. Because at the moment it's very expensive and by reducing the cost, we can make the solution available to more families that, or more couples that want to start their family. Um, thanks, Pedro. And I think that's one of the, I think with both um, Angel's and Pedro's example, it's in, it's good to see how um, you they've used entrepreneurship to kind of take their their research. And I know Pedro, your um, co-founders have been doing the research. Um, and same with him, like you, you're not just I. It's a team, but taking that research and leading into impact through an entrepreneurship pathway. So I think that's something that is quite. Um, which in the health space, we don't normally think about. Um, are there any questions for Pedro? Go ahead, V. Um, thank you, Pedro, for sharing your journey as always. Um, I do have one question because you shared your journey, how your idea at the beginning, it can change so rapidly as you progress through the different stages of conceptualize it and materialize the idea into actual actions. When you hit a, a setback, Right, because these things happen all the time because um, you know things can happen. And if you hit a setback or a challenges, do you just what would what would be the one thing that you tell yourself to keep moving forward? Is it just sheer will or is that a, a something that, that you tell yourself to keep going to overcome the challenges? I think that in the journey of entrepreneurship, you're always going to hit these sort of problems. So you need to be prepared. To, to find solutions. And that's what's gonna set you for success. You, you will see that today that's a problem, but then with the help of others, you can find the solution, find the way, and the most unexpected ways you will find someone that has an answer or a contact and, and you will solve it. You just need to be very persistent. And that's one of the qualities that um, you need to have as an entrepreneur and as well the network that, for example, this program will provide is that you're not alone. You always have someone that's going to help you that went through that and that can connect you so you, you, can, you can progress and continue with your startup. Thanks, Pedro. No, thanks, Ange. Thanks, Pedro. So here you've, you've heard two great founders at different levels of their journey, how they took something which was more um, from the research point of view and then kind of taking it to impact through the pathway of entrepreneurship and using and the pre-accelerated programs are a way to help you do that. As I said, we also have the amazing Dina here who I think both Pedro and Ange mentioned. And Dina, I know you've seen a lot of founders. I know you've, um, you've seen them through the journey. When you see them day one, and when you see them at the end of, even after 10 weeks, what's the big difference do you see that are, happens because of pre-accelerator program? That's a great question. Um, thank you, Rabia. First of all, who is entrepreneur for me is someone who sees the problem and have the drive and desire to solve for it. So when we see an, those entrepreneurs, they don't call themselves this way yet in the beginning of the program. It is first of all, um, and often lack of confidence in the way they perceive themselves and things they can achieve. They always underestimate what they can do. And the second thing, by the end of the 10 weeks, we can see more clarity and confidence in them executing their pathway to impact or pathway to commercialization. Because they realize that entrepreneurship is not some uh, fluffy concept. It has tools, frameworks um, that people can use to achieve what they want. And also through the program through UNSW Founders and the George Institute for Global Health, we provide a platform for those entrepreneurs to learn, connect, and access resources that they need at the right point of time. So they realize it's not a journey on its own, but they are actually a part of the bigger community that will support them going forward. So as of on week number one, we will see someone making a maybe a statement that we have a solution X that will help uh, all patients and we will sell to all doctors. I'm just giving you an example. Uh, by the end of week 10, the same startup will be saying our solutions benefit as X, Y, Z, and we will get it to the end users who are a subsection of this population via these channels. And we know that our next steps are 
one, two, three to get there. So they have a plan. So I guess that's the key difference going from a bit of lack of confidence and lack of clarity towards execution to understanding how the ecosystem works, what are the next steps and how to get there. Um, thanks, Dina. Sounds like, and I think I think one of the things that is coming clear from Dina, Pedro, and Ange, that early stage people are, it's very um, fluffy. And Dina, I liked how you said people don't view themselves as an entrepreneur. And I know for a very long time I didn't because of the definition is I think Steve Jobs yes. or Mark Zuckerberg as entrepreneurs, and not. Um, and I think that, like that is your. You're passionate about solving a problem kind of thing and you, that's the main thing and I, I totally agree in how you take that um journey as we heard like Andrew went through, um, is doing in the world of academia charity and a business because you've got your purpose you've got your impact and you're trying to the different pathways and this is just an additional pathway to use to get the maximum impact um Quickly before we finish off, Dina, what would you say? What would you people should um, expect? And I guess from all three um, people, uh, um, in terms of what if people here apply for the form, I think some of them already have. Um, what what should their expectations be? Is it something where they just kind of sit back and relax, kind of thing? I know I know what the answer is going to be, but <laughs> in terms of what they what should they be expecting in terms of when they start the program. First of all, I always say you'll get as much out of the program as as you would put into this. And people who would progress and benefit most are those who show up and contribute more. So what to expect? It's a structured, proven entrepreneurial education that we have been running for the past five years at the University of New South Wales at the Georgian Institute for Global Health. So you will have access to the latest tools and frameworks. Uh, what to expect? Accountability, because we would love you to solve for those challenges. So we will help you uh, to keep accountable and keep moving and removing the barriers for you. And what to expect is a community and support, because entrepreneurial journey is lonely sometimes. And the key for us is for all of you to create a strong community. So it's not only mentors and us as program facilitators who will provide you support, but you also can rely on each other on peer learning and peer support as well. So I guess those three things will be the takeaway in addition to everything that we have discussed. But I would encourage everyone who is applying to think about it as an opportunity to gain an incredible amount of support should you wish to put time, effort, and a bit more heart into it. And I think, you know, that's what I love about these programs is because it allows people to kind of think, yes, I'm going to make an impact to actually, how yes. do I make an impact? And also, as you said, it's a lonely journey. And you might think at the end of it, oh, maybe I need to go to the drawing board kind of thing. Or I need to do a bit more thinking. But it is that kind of very structured, but with accountability and community. I think those two things are very difficult. You can't find that in a book. You can't find that in an online um, course. These are the things that you only get by being part of a structured program. Um, and what would you say, what would you say to people to, what should they expect? Like how can they get the best out of being in a program? All right, the first thing you need to do in the morning when you're just about to walk out the door and start the program is to look yourself in the mirror and say, be open to learning. I'm a lifelong student. Don't have any negative sort of thoughts or ideas going into this and really be open-minded. Um, I consider myself one of the most flexible people. Um, I really do. I work across different sectors. And for me to be stretched to even another level of flexibility was just amazing. So I think that's what you need to do is, you know, don't put yourself in a box when you go in there. And remember this. And I agree with Pedro, your, your product is going to change. So be prepared to take feedback. Sometimes the feedback will be perceived as negative from where you sit, but it's, it's, it's like anything. And what academia has taught me is peer review. The process of peer review makes the paper, makes the book better, makes the degree sharper. So feedback from all of these people that you'll be interacting with, they will make your product better each and every moment that you take advice. Don't block that out. Open that, you know, become more flexible in 
being able to get feedback and don't see it as positive or negative. So that's my, my suggestion. I'm not sure, Pedro, Pedro, what, what is yours? Sorry. Okay, yeah. I totally agree with you. I think that to get the most out of this is to have an open mind and to, be, to put your best effort and to rely on people that have more experience, be humble and just put yourself forward. I think that um, the, the, the exposure and seeing what other people is doing is going to help you to succeed. So don't be afraid and apply. Thanks, Pedro. Thanks, Ange, and thanks, Dina. Um, are there any questions from people? Can I ask a question to the group coming in who would like to answer this? What are your fears? This is a great forum to talk about someone's fears. Like, what is your fear with your idea? <clears throat> like, tell us, because it's very interesting, because when you start to hear that come out of your own mouth, and you'll finish this call going, that's not even a fear anymore. Does anyone have any fears? about their idea that it's too big too small too silly to this to that i'm happy to answer that so hi everyone thank you for your great talk i learned a lot my name is fatima and i'm hoping to start this program to get an idea of what i can incorporate in my uh, phd project looking at health service delivery for the elderly cult population um, I guess my fear is um, not just with this program, but in general, spending that time researching this topic and not getting any substantial um, an outcome from it that I can apply in the real world. So it's kind of that time, I guess not wasted, but that time spent on something that may or may not be useful. Dina, do you want to answer that? Because I'd love to quickly answer that too. But Tim, I can promise you now, my PhD has become better, stronger. I am more confident when I sit with my supervisors across, when I give papers. I, I'm going to Boston now to give a paper in addiction. I'm stronger, more confident because I've done this program, because I have had so many different people to test my ideas on that you will not waste your time. I can promise you it will make your academic work much stronger. Just plus one to this. Thanks, Angie, for kicking off Fatima. Um, what we are learning and seeing through all our work with researchers, and now we supported dozens and dozens of researchers with their um, research commercialization translation, entrepreneurship and research follow the same processes. Entrepreneurial tools frameworks help researchers to um, broaden their views, their market, their impact, just because we're giving you tools to look at populations or impact from a different perspective. So when you incorporate this in your current work, it basically gets richer, it's, it doesn't take from it. And there is a very famous um, startup book, it's called Startup. And you know what, it's called a Lean, Lean Startup, which talks about Lean methodology. When we give it to researchers to read, they come with a shining eyes and they say, huh, startup is the same as research. You are doing a set of assumptions. You are coming up with the methods. You are seeing some results, making conclusions just to make a next set of assumptions and so forth. So don't think about this as a two separate ways to make impact. It is a complementary thing that in ideal world should take side by side for you to really have an impact that is practical translated and apologies for saying that not just ended up being on a library shelf as a PhD dissertation being published. Yeah exactly thank you for that Dina and Angie helpful. Um, anyone else wants to share their fears? Angie I think that was a great question in terms of what's um, stopping people from starting kind of thing or I think we're also coming closer to the time. Yeah. Maybe some final comments. I'm also monitoring the chat. Okay. I will definitely join after this talk and I will hope to see everyone here uh, during the application, but I will be in touch. Thank you so much for providing us with the opportunity. I'll take it. I'll take the risk. Challenge accepted. <laughs> Thanks, V. And I think this is it. I mean, it's it's 10 weeks. You get to trial out your idea, 
see if it's got any legs and basically also think, how do I make impact with my idea? And sometimes your idea may be very vague, as we heard, or it could be something that you, you know the problem and you kind of think there's a solution. But um, I think Pedro's example is a great one, how they went from an AI to a device. So, but the problem remained the same, but the solution changed. And I think that's what this program allows you to do. And, um, and it, it's just such a great opportunity. And um, if there are any questions, um, we can take maybe, you can put it in the chat box or else um, send me an email. And if you wanna have another chat, I'm more than happy to have a chat with people if they wanna kind of discuss their application. Final thoughts from Pedro, Dina and Ange before we sign off. And thank you everyone for taking time to join. And contact us on LinkedIn, even just to help you. Even if you're not joining the program, you know, you never know where we'll all help each other in the future. So, um, Pedro, I've already sent you an email. <laughs> We're going to have a Zoom call about Chile. We're looking for an agent and a licensee in, in South America. Good luck, everyone. That's what I wanted to say. Just go for it. Don't be afraid. Yeah, and for me, thank you very much for joining. I am more than happy to work with all of you in your ideas. I'm pretty sure that everybody's going to get something interesting out of this. So I look forward to working with you. And so thank you, everyone. I know you thank you for giving us your time, your um, your attention. Thank you so much and hope to see your applications. Even if you don't, um, if it's not the right time, still connect with us and we can see what we can, how we can help you. So thank you, everyone. Bye.